and God bless you. Welcome to this life group. It's so great to see you here. Uh, I hope you're enjoying the fellowship. I hope you're getting to talk with some people that uh, maybe you don't get to spend that much time with. And uh, I'd like to ask you to do me a favor. Welcome all of the new people or say hey to the newer people who are coming to your life group and uh, tell them, say, God bless you. Amen. Thank you guys for being here. And uh, by all means, go out and invite somebody to life group. Life groups ought to be uh, evangelistic. They ought to be growing. And uh, we need a lot more life groups than what we have. And so if you're interested in being a host, please come and speak with me about that. I also want to uh, thank all of our hosts for allowing us into your home. God bless you guys. There's a great reward and a great blessing for people who are frontline ministry like you guys are, and, and we're very thankful for you at Christ Church. Uh, I'm going to pray, and we're going to get straight into the Word tonight. Let's do that. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you that your Word is so greatly anointed. Your Word does not pass away. Lord, we come and we go, but your world your, your word remains forever, Father. Lord, there's, there's all sorts of things that we attach so much importance to that are just fading things. Lord, help us to hold your word in high esteem and live by it. In Jesus' name we pray, amen and amen. Uh, tonight is our 10th uh, week of our 12-week life group series, and uh, our relationship principle uh, tonight that we're finishing up is that the greatest are servants. The greatest are servants. Tell somebody, you ought to be great. Amen. You ought to be great. The greatest are servants. Matthew chapter 23, verse 11 and 12 says, The greatest among you will be your servants. For whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and whoever humbles himself will be exalted. In that scripture right there, you have a job and God has a job. Uh, your job is to humble yourself because the natural tendency of our flesh is to lift ourselves up. But your job as a Christian to be Christ-like is to humble yourself and God's job is to exalt you. You don't ever want to get in the business of taking God's job and exalting yourself because that will force him to take your job and he'll be in the position of humbling you. And uh, that's, that's not a good uh, position to be in. I, I think he's better at humbling. He's better at everything than we are. He's better at humbling than we are and he's better at exalting than we are. So do your job and let God do his job. Last week we covered uh, our desire to be great. We covered how to handle ambition and our desire to be noticed. We discussed all of those things. This week we're going to kind of pick up uh, the last half of the greatest or servants. And uh, I want to talk to you about a few things. Uh, I want to talk to you about godly humility, how you live a humble life. Uh, how does humility handle our tendency to compare ourselves to others is the first thing I want to discuss with you. It, it's such a, a, a dangerous and such a deadly thing when we fall into the habit of always comparing ourselves with others. At, but most of us do it all the time. Uh, we equate on some level being the greatest with being first. We equate on some level being the greatest with being first. Greatness really doesn't have anything to do with who's first. It's another matter entirely. We're going to look at your definition of greatness tonight. But when we walk into a room, when we go into a business meeting, when we start a conversation, do we not find ourselves asking, where do I stand in this social setting? Am I ahead of this person or behind that person? Am I above or am I below? And, and we all fall into the comparison trap far too often. And the comparison trap can ruin the best relationships in your life. It doesn't matter how great your relationship is. When you fall into the comparison trap, you have a great chance of ruining your relationships. And, uh, you know, 
I, I, I talk to women. You can hear women thinking inside their head sometimes, and, and men do the same thing, and, and it's always this comparison game. Well, oh, I wish my husband was like so-and-so. He seems so much more attentive than my husband. Oh, look at how he's treating her. He seems to give her so much more attention than my husband gives me. Oh, look at, and, and you just make this list of things that this other person does better compared to your husband. And men are the same way. Oh, she thinks I'm the greatest thing since sliced bread. She always treats me with respect. She treats me with more respect than my wife does. She listens to my ideas, and my wife don't want to hear nothing I've got to say. Every time I put out an idea, my wife shoots it down. But she thinks she takes all my ideas seriously, and she sees the value in me. Or, ooh, I wish my wife looked like dot, dot, dot. And so you have this comparison trap that people fall into. And then the two of you get together, not only you're comparing one another, then you start comparing your kids. You, you go out with somebody, you go, why can't my kids act like their kids? Why can't my kids behave like that? Why can't my kids get their kids' grades in school? Why can't my kids do this? And the comparison trap is a recipe for misery, disaster, and unrest. It's misery, disaster, and unrest. And really, it is Satan and your flesh that is tempting you to always compare and take the joy right out of life. And so... In the scripture, Jesus gives an example where uh, everybody is uh, at a dinner, uh, a wedding feast, and he watches. Jesus was a people watcher. I'm a people watcher. Uh, Jesus was watching where everybody sat at the party, and, and he was watching how people were uh, gauging where to sit at the table because there was a place of honor at the table, and how close or how far away you sat from the place of honor uh, spoke something socially about you. And so people were comparing themselves to one another to try to sit in the right place because they wanted to be as high as they could be and as close to the place of honor as possible. Musical chairs for social climbers. And so Jesus sees all of this going on, and then he says this. This is relationship advice from Jesus. He says, when somebody invites you to a feast or a party, don't take the place of honor. For a person more distinguished than you may have been invited. And if so, they'll say, the host will come to you and say, give this man your seat. And then humiliated, you'll have to go and you'll have to take a very low seat of little importance. But when you're invited, come in and take a low place, the lowest place from the very beginning. And then when the host comes in, he'll see you sitting in the low place and he'll say, hey friend, come up here to a higher place closer to me and you'll be honored rather than being humiliated in the presence of your fellow guests. And then he gives this beautiful scripture again, for everyone who exalts himself will be humble and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And so we all face a daily greatness quiz. You, you quiz yourself daily in this area of compa uh, comparison. We all do a daily greatness quiz. How great am I today? How great am I in this group of people? How great am I in this social setting? And the question is, will I exalt myself and try to take first place? Or will I humble myself and decide to take the lowest seat? Uh, greatness quiz. I, I like that. Jesus taught us that greatness is not a matter of winning a competition. Ooh, you ought to write that down if you like to write things down. That'd change your life right there. Greatness is not a matter of winning a competition. Greatness is a matter of humbly living the life that God gave you to live. Greatness is a matter of fulfilling the purpose God intends for you to serve. And, you know, only so many people can be in the very top spot. Everybody can't be bishop. Everybody can't be the leader in the household. Everybody can't be the best at everything. And so greatness is not being first. Greatness is fulfilling God's will for your life.
fulfilling God's will for your life. You ought to write that down. And so uh, the, God's not going to ask you, will you get to the finish line before anybody else? He's asking you, who are you going to help take across the finish line with you? Um, I, I deal with leaders and I deal with spiritual people all the time. And, and I deal with people who have great zeal and great passion and great ambition. And all of those things are wonderful as long as they're in bounds. But one of the hardest things for passionate leaders to learn is that you cannot go somewhere quickly as a leader unless you're prepared to leave everybody else behind. Oh, it, it, it's great to go to a higher place. It's great to go to a different level, a higher level, but you're not going to go there fast and take anybody with you. You may get there, but you won't take anybody with you along the way. If, if you're going to go to another level and bring people with you, then you'll have to do it slowly and you'll have to help people who are limping and you'll have to put somebody's shoulder around your arm and you'll have to hold on to them and help carry them across the finish line with you if you're going to be a godly leader that takes people with you. And really, that's the only kind of leadership Jesus is interested in. He, he doesn't care what spiritual pinnacle you arrive at. He's interested as a leader, how many people are you taking with you on this journey to knowing him more and greater. Wow, how powerful. And most people would be really happy to sit in the lowest seat if they had a guarantee that somebody was going to come and take them and put them in the highest seat. Oh, that, that would be wonderful. I wouldn't have a problem humbling myself as long as I knew that God was going to pick me up high and say, everybody look at him and put you in the highest spot. But that's not always... A guaranteed thing. God will place you where you need to be if you'll be humble enough to allow him to do that. If you're in a low spot, if you don't exalt yourself, if you take the humble spot and God, he's the host. If he comes to you and he wants to move you to a place that better suits his purpose, you'll be happy to leave the lowest spot to fulfill his purpose. But if you've put yourself in the highest spot, a place that doesn't necessarily line up with God's purpose for you to be there. And then God, the host, comes to you and he wants to move you to a place where you can better fulfill his purpose for your life, where you can achieve greatness according to his measure of greatness in a better way, you will reject him moving you. You will feel humiliated. You will feel distraught. You will become angry. You will become bitter. You will become resentful. And the kingdom of God is filled with ineffectiveness and dysfunction because people have exalted themselves to places that God didn't intend for them to be. And they refuse to allow him to move them to a place where they can fulfill their purpose that he intended for them to fulfill. Oh, that, that, just, that causes so much dysfunction in the kingdom of God. Don't be that sort of a person. Be somebody who is always willing to achieve what God wants you to achieve, not what you think would make you look the greatest. Mm, I'm going too slow. I, I'm, I'm, I'm getting off of my, my notes and into leadership teaching tonight. But this is great teaching for everybody. Everybody. Uh, people's uh, humility and spiritual maturity usually go through three phases. In phase one, most new Christians are ruled by selfishness, and so they always strive for the top spot, and it's pretty obvious, and it can be either humorous or disgusting. Uh, if you love people and, 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 you, and you've got some maturity and wisdom, you'll, you'll find it more humorous, and, and you can work with somebody. But it's usually pretty obvious. Immature people striving for the top spot. In phase two, uh, Christians start getting a little understanding, and then they start taking the lowest spot, hoping that somebody, hoping that taking the lowest spot will guarantee them the highest spot. And and then those people end up resenting what they're doing, and and that causes all sorts of problems. But then there's a third phase where we have gotten comfortable in our own skin. And we are equally comfortable either in the bottom spot or 
the top spot. Paul said that most beautiful thing where I've learned to be content in every circumstance that I find myself in. You have to be comfortable enough in your own skin that no matter what your assignment in any one given situation is, it doesn't damage who you are as a person, does it change who you are as a person, and uh, you, you can just function in that role in that particular group. Because you're going to find yourself being in the top spot in some situations and the lowest spot in other situations and somewhere in the middle everywhere else. And you're not going to be in the top spot all that often simply because there's only one top spot. You're going to be in one of the other positions most of the time. Occasionally you'll be in the top spot. And so if you only operate the right way when you're in that spot a small percentage of the time and the rest of the time you have your lips stuck way out here, then you're just never going to function really well at all. As a matter of fact, you'll be so warped that when you get the top spot, you won't even function well there. It'll be about you instead of God's purpose, and you'll make a train wreck out of things there as well. But here is the beautiful surprise that God brings. It's often that in lower spots, or even the lowest spot, that we find life's greatest blessings. The richest relationships, the purest joys, and the most profound influences are often to be found out of the limelight before you gain any notoriety when you are free to simply love and serve without all of the attention. I talked to somebody just recently and they said, man, I, I spent time with them away from church and people are so different when you're away from church. It's like this mask comes off and people are just real and they're fun and, and they're so genuine and it is fantastic. Oh, it's just so much easier to serve God when you're not trying to always put on a show for people. So understand that you've got to enjoy no matter what circumstance you find yourself in and you've got to be able to serve effectively no matter where you're at. You've got to do the greatly daily greatness quiz and stop comparing yourself to other people. Wherever God puts me today, I'm going to do something to make a difference for him and change the world today. It doesn't matter if I'm a Sunday school teacher. It doesn't matter if I'm following uh, somebody else's leadership. It doesn't matter if I'm just a volunteer. It doesn't matter if I'm only doing this on this committee or whatever at, at school or in church or in the family. Make a difference for God wherever you're at. And so humility should handle comparisons in this way. Reject comparisons. Uh, be willing for God to place you where you can best fulfill his purpose. Greatness is not being first. Greatness is fulfilling your purpose. And so humility rejects comparisons. And humility handles your relationship with God this way, you again, the quiz is, will I exalt myself or will I humble myself? Uh, we have the uh, parable Jesus told about the Pharisee going in to pray, who said, I thank God that I'm not like other men. I'm not like this publican and this sinner at the back of the sanctuary. I don't drink. I don't do this. I don't do that. I tithe. I fast. I pray. And, and he just had kind of a running commentary about how great he was. The sinner come into the back of the sanctuary and he was too ashamed and humble before God to even lift up his eyes towards heaven and staring at the ground, he just cried out, Oh God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And Jesus said that it was that man who went home justified, right with God, rather than the Pharisee who made a long list of things that he was doing for God. And so here are warning signs that you're losing your humility. You start to become confident in yourself rather than in God. Confident in yourself rather than in God. Uh, you become condemning of others. When, when, when you start exalting yourself and begin condemning others, that's a warning sign that you've lost all sense of humility. And also when you become content with externals, I fast and I give a tenth. It's not that there's anything wrong with these externals. It's just that uh, they're not all that there are. The, the way that you look on the outside is, <laughs> I mean, that, that's important, but 
how you look on the inside. What's going on inside of you is equally important. And so the solution to this do-it-yourself form of religion is to trust in God. Jesus said very simply, do not let your heart be troubled. Trust, you trust in God, trust also in me. Uh, if you will trust in Jesus and understand grace, if you'll trust in Jesus and understand what he has done for you and, and how great his sacrifice was and how bad you needed a sacrifice, then it becomes very easy to be humble. So uh, trust in Jesus. Uh, lots of people, you know, and Jesus even said it, you trust in God, and that's good for people to have a generic trust in God, but trusting in Jesus, in the revelation of Jesus, and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ for your sins will always help you with your level of humility. Tell somebody, say, trust Jesus. Amen. Trust Jesus. And, um, and I want to close out tonight by leaving you with one picture that God gave us. And this has a lot to deal with humility. It'll help you keep uh, yourself in check. And it'll help you understand that greatness, uh, the greatest are the servants. The greatest are the people who are fulfilling a purpose in the kingdom of God. And this is out of the book of John, such a, a beautiful and powerful set of scriptures. He says, I am the vine and you are the branches. I'm the vine, you are the branches. It's a simple picture that communicates two things we need to remember in order to live a great life. And, and, and number one is he's the vine, we're the branches. God does not intend for your life to stand on its own. He doesn't intend for you to support all the weight of your life. The, the branch is supported by the vine itself. The branch draws all of its life, all of its sustenance, all of its nourishment from the vine. And then in turn, the branches bear fruit for the kingdom of God. And so Jesus is the vine. Uh, he's life-giving and, uh, and, 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 and fruit-bearing strength all come from the vine to the branches. Jesus is the vine, we are the branches. And so what is a branch's job? What's the number one job of a branch? The most important thing a branch can do is stay attached to the vine. The number one thing, the most important thing for a branch to do is stay attached to the vine because if you ever get disconnected from the vine, you're toast, honey. You can't do nothing uh, if you're disconnected from the vine. And so the number one thing is to stay attached to the vine. It's not to bear fruit. It's not to look good. It's not to achieve whatever it is that you think you may be required to achieve. The greatest responsibility of the branch is to stay attached to the vine. And so uh, the fruit that we bear when we are attached to the vine is being like Jesus. Not just in, in, in you know, in externals, but in internals as well. And uh, Jesus goes on in this scripture and he talks about uh, cutting back <laughs> branches and uh, pruning branches uh, so that they can bear more fruit. And uh, I, I have uh, experienced the pruning process of God and I've seen many other people go through the pruning process of God and there's always this shock and disbelief and there's always this huge disruption and misunderstanding in our lives anytime God begins to prune us. Uh, sometimes we, we're, we're cursing and rebuking the devil and the devil ain't touched you. It's just God pruning you. Oh, I'm messing up folks' theology tonight. Uh, everything you blame on the devil is not the devil. Sometimes God prunes the branches so they're able to bear more fruit. And Christians react this way. They, everything's going great. I'm growing. Things are looking good. And then all of a sudden, snip. God, what on earth are you doing? Why are you doing? That was my best looking offshoot, God. That was my biggest, prettiest leaf. And you cut my biggest, prettiest leaf off. I was looking good. I was looking good. And you cut my leaf off, God. That was my best looking one. I was impressing folk with that leaf. I was, I was trying to see how long I can make that offshoot, God. And you come 
I was getting my offshoot longer than their offshoot. I was showing more progress than they were. And you cut me off. God will prune you, but God always does it for a very specific purpose. He does it so that you're able to bear more fruit. You're able to bear more fruit. Vines, different from trees, need drastic pruning in order to continue to be fruitful. Sometimes a gardener can cut up to 90 to 95% of a grapevine in pruning. That's shocking, isn't it? Uh, but God will trim you back, not because he wants to hurt you, but because he wants you to have the strength that it will take to make it for the long haul and to bear much fruit. The question is, is are you humble enough to handle the pruning that comes from God? Yes, it hurts to be pruned, but God is more interested in your growth than your comfort. God is more interested in your purpose than your looks. God is more interested in your greatness according to his definition rather than your definition or what may be the world's definition of greatness. He's not worried about you being first and looking the best. He's worried about you bearing fruit and fulfilling purpose. God's message is simple. Abide in me and I in you. Stay 100% attached to God and You'll deal better with the comparison trap. You'll deal better with your relationships in life. And you'll stay uh, closer to your purpose and greatness in God because you'll be fulfilling the purpose that he has for you. You cannot have a Christian marriage without abiding in Christ. You cannot have a Christian business. You can't have a Christ-centered home. You can't do anything. You can be a Christian with a home, and you can be a Christian who's married, but you're not going to have a Christian marriage, a Christ-like marriage or home, unless you stay attached to the vine, abiding in the vine. And so we all have a daily decision to make. Are we going to humble ourselves or exalt ourselves? That's your daily greatness quiz. Am I going to exalt myself today or am I going to humble myself today? Such a powerful question to ask you. And so uh, I, I'm going to leave you with this question tonight. Is there any ugly point of pride that you have been ignoring in your life that now might be a good time to deal with? Listen to me. The comparison trap will end marriages. You don't know how he acts at home. You just know the way he acts in public. You don't know the way she acts at home. You just know the way she acts in public. You don't know how she treats her husband. Uh, you, you, she may think you, you treat you like you're the greatest thing since sliced bread, but she's not picking up your dirty underwear off the floor either. And so, it, oh Jesus, I, I could just preach right there. Don't fall into the comparison trial. And for goodness sakes, never compare your children to one another and say, why can't you be more like so-and-so? Or why can't you be like your friends down the street? Or why can't you be like your sister? Or why can't you be like? Never fall into that comparison trap. That's a dangerous thing. And so what point of pride do you need to deal with tonight? And, uh, and I'm going to pray for you. And I just believe you're going to have a great discussion tonight. Be real with uh, one another tonight. Father, in Jesus' name, we thank you for your word. And Lord, we thank you that you can help us uh, to be so comfortable that we can serve you whether we're in the top spot or the bottom spot. That, Lord, we can be so close to you and we can know you so well and we can feel so assured in the value that you've placed in us that, Lord, we don't have to take our value from external things and external positions and we can just be free to serve you in love and in truth and with honor. And, Lord, we thank you for that. Bless the discussion tonight. In Jesus' mighty name, amen and amen. God bless you guys. Have a great discussion.